Guys, so just a quick additional clip to apologise for the mm, mediocre audio on this podcast. I've been playing about with using my new headphones for audio. I didn't quite connect on this episode, so, so for some reason I was using... I don't even know where my audio is coming from, from my speaker. So my end was a bit crackly, and then likewise Callum's end with his connection was a little bit crackly on a few occasions. So apologies for that. Make sure it's fixed for the next one. Uh, Looking forward to fielding your questions in the future and looking forward to seeing what you guys deem is a good name for this podcast. Uh, So yeah, guys, enjoy and speak soon. Okay, hey guys, and welcome to an unnamed version of Team Muscle Radio that we haven't quite thought of a name for yet. But what we're going to do is we're going to essentially ask you, the listeners, uh, already, straight away, uh, that if you do have an idea of a name for this potential side podcast, uh, me and Callum may well run this on a bi-weekly or a monthly basis, depending on how popular it is. Um, and whether we field questions that we get through Instagram, because I know that we do get a lot on a daily basis, it might be a cool way for me and Callum to actually get back to people. And I mean, I, I know we spend a lot of time answering DMs anyway, but what we might do is just say, yeah, we'll screenshot your questions and then we'll cover them in, in like I said, either a bi-weekly or a, a monthly episode. I know that Callum has his own podcast um, with a friend of his. I have my own also, um, but there's no reason why we can't sort of run a sideline event um, along those two podcasts that we do run. So, uh, of course, you guys know, know who Callum is, um, uh, CR Physique on Instagram, for anyone who doesn't know Callum's actual name. I <laughs> imagine there's a few out there. Uh, luckily, my Instagram is my name, so you'll probably know me. Um, but anyway, guys, we're going to crack on with uh, one topic today. It's going to be quite a short podcast, um, so ideal for if you're someone that isn't completely catabolic and doing hours of cardio, um, but you're maybe doing a short bout or you're getting in your your steps, your accumulating steps. So we're going to cover the the post-competition window um, and what we deem as potentially the best way to approach this um, from a nutritional perspective and potentially we'll cover a little bit on on training and mindset as well uh, because I think they both play a role um, and how we'd, we'd, we'd approach this purely because a lot of competitors are going through this right now. They've either fucked it up already or they're, uh, they're in a phase where they're just transitioning. I know that the, the NABBA shows have just finished, UKBFF wasn't long ago, uh, and now basically we've got the Stranglers uh, that, that are coming to sort of the World Finals or a few other events like UK Up have just finished, so we've got the Stragglers and then they'll be in the post-competition window as well. So, Callum, first up, um, let's just get your overall generic approach to how you'd approach nutrition um, from the post-competition window. Lay down initially is when people refer to, I know you've talked about it a lot through your approach in terms of in prep as well and increasing food incrementally over time. Sure. Is a is a is a quite an important thing to consider in terms of the difference between somebody reverse dieting and somebody then coming out of a, a a relatively severe deficit from a prep, and that would be more of kind of like a recovery diet, I guess. Now the difference with the reverse diet being like the example that you put on your website the other day, AJ. The difference between reverse diet, which, you know, AJ has been doing during his prep in terms of he's created this energy deficit and he's mobilized a lot of fat over a long period of time. And in that position now, he's now in a position where he can then incrementally increase food very, very slowly over time. He's still in in an energy balance that will continue to mobilize fat. Every increase he's adding in now, he's benefiting from those kind of uh, acute reversals in metabolic adaptation as well. So he's getting small increases in things like leptin, small increases in things like thyroid function, metabolic rate. Every time he's adding in food, but he's able to stay in an energy deficit where he can continue to get leaner and leaner and leaner. And that's why his approach during prep has been so successful to get to where he is now because he's timed it perfectly. Um, and yours, you know, you, we can see through your, through your, you know, photos and stuff that you put on social media and every time you're stepping on stage this year that you're bringing a, a leaner package, but you're also looking fuller as time goes on. 
and your ability to present that is because you're in this period now where it's a perfect opportunity for your body to soak up more food but continue to progress. Now, one of the one of the big things that we need to consider here is that post prep, for example, after your after your world finals, when you go over to the states, which will, I, I presume that'll be your final show, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. After, <laughs> after like six weeks of dieting. <laughs> yeah. Um, after, fucking year. <laughs> after that prep, AJ then doesn't want to then um, spend the next 20, 25 weeks slowly working his way back up to what would be kind of a maintenance or a relative surplus to then put on tissue because he's already thinking, right, I've, I've got shows in however many months' time for a next competitive season. I actually need to make some improvements here. And uh, the, the kind of example we highlighted yesterday, buddy, in terms of the, the Lane Norton example where he reversed this guy for like 25 weeks and this guy kept shredded glutes for 25 weeks. It's, it's amazing from a kind of like a, a physiological standpoint. But when and we look at toughness standpoint, and yeah, incredibly. But when we look at like the productivity of that as a bodybuilder, he, he's made zero change in terms of actually accumulating more tissue and bringing a different package. So although it's great, we've got to look at the actual value that that gives in the first place. And 99% of people wouldn't have the mental to capacity to continue dieting and digging for that period of time um because when you're adding such a small amount of food for a long period of time you'll still feel like you're dieting for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and when now, the goal when the hyper focus goal of the show as well when that's ditched you yeah, automatically exactly. you it, it's like you end the day and if you end the day hungry you are mm. like why am i hungry and that yeah, ties yeah. in with the mental aspect of things you you can go to bed hungry when you're when you're prepping for a show because yeah. you know that in two weeks you've got to compete and you've got to stand up there and and be the best version of yourself and be shredded to not yeah. you not you not gonna stand a chance. There's no fucking reason for you to be shredded. So you ask yourself why am I hungry at the end of the day and then you end up either overeating or you know, you, you increment up your calories more to suffice that or, or to, mm. to, to feed that satiety. Yeah, completely. Um, and from, from a post-show perspective, um, like my emphasis will then be on, instead of reviewing it as a reverse diet in terms of trying to keep someone as lean as possible, we then view it as recovering from a dieting phase. So post-show, post that last show, we're going to have a lot of diet and training reduce, uh, induced fatigue. So our first approach would then be to try and minimize fatigue and bring food up to a level where I'm not thinking, right, I need to get them to maintain those calories or whatever that number might be. It's going to be a moving target. But my goal is to get them to maintain those calories immediately or as soon as possible because they're going to suddenly feel better. It's simply to think, playing a little bit of cat and mouse and thinking, I'm going to put some food in and see how he feels. And then if that needs to increase, I'm going to find a balance where he's, he's feeling okay, he's sleeping well, he's recovering, he's not stressed, training's starting to feel better again. And then once we've found that point, it might be, you know, you take your, your total weekly energy balance for the last week of your prep or before peak week or whatever, it might be like three, 400 calories above that. And then we can hold him there for a week or two weeks and then slowly start to chip away from there. So it's not going to mean you finish your, you finish your final week on... 1800 calories and then the week after i'm going to put you on 1850 it's going to mean we're going to go from 1800 calories and then find some point whether it's two three four hundred calories where you start to feel good again and then slowly work our way out from there yeah and i think the important thing that you note there is the the individual variability on the Absolutely. calorie amount and i think that the most important thing as a coach that i specifically look for when either reversing or recovering someone from a show is is more so going by how people feel and how they're responding to the increments as opposed yeah. to looking at things on a, on, a, on a piece of paper perspective. So you can, you can write out what would be essentially the, the perfect recovery or the, the perfect reverse diet. And in reality, it, it, it might be very different for, for a vast majority of individuals. For example, you know, some people might have got to 400 carb on a reverse and literally just started gaining weight and that was it you know that was where mm. they, they had their ticking point um and then some others can metabolically adapt upwards far in, in, in far greater amounts um yeah and that's going to be a large part genetic uh, and how you respond to calorie increases so a lot of people simply just you know from what i've seen they they suck up the food 
and they don't really do much more. But I, but I, I think with myself and with a few other clients I've worked with, I've given them more food and they just continue to output, 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 whether that's, yeah. you know, standing up more, whether that's, you know, putting more effort into your training. I think the biggest thing that I've noticed is my output in my sessions is just, it's it's on another level comparative to yeah. when I was in a in a larger energy deficit. So yeah. if anything, I'm I'm catching up on a lot of the calories that I was essentially losing or or, or lost um, through the fact that, that I've increased them and I, and I've instead I've I've simply done a little bit more output. Um, mm. You know the energy balance doesn't the energy balance equation is still there, guys. It's there's what you're what you're seeing throughout a reverse diet. Yes, there's some individual variability which can be looked upon as magic, but it's not. It's not really fucking magic, you know. The the energy balance equation is is still very much there. Um, so cool. Okay, wicked. So, I think that people would be quite interested in terms of the post competition window. What can we do to maximise those nutrients that we are now adding? Um, because mm. a lot of people will, will, will simply look at, you know, they might be coming from a from a diet that wasn't even set up that well in the first place. So, for example, from a, from a nutrient timing perspective, mm. uh, they might have just sort of been very much eating, and this is what happens to a lot of people that are given macros, is that they might very much eat towards primarily adherence which yeah. is obviously it's obviously the main goal for most but i think as performance-based athletes and you know this you know our nutrient timing should definitely be playing a role if we're looking to be the best athlete that we can be we're not general population here we're looking to eke out the best so so when we do add in these calories how can people look to essentially maximize their use and where, where would you see sort of uh, the calorie increases coming from and, and where then would you place those macronutrients throughout the day in your in your sort of uh, best best opinion? Sure. So like we've got to think the the position somebody comes out of after whether it's a show, whether it's a photo shoot, whatever, you know, that point in your training year is going to be your most optimal point to then grow from because metabolically although things have slowed down so to speak in terms of the body just being very adaptive in how it's responding to less adipose tissue and how it's responding to the body being leaner we've got to think that that's going to be your most insulin sensitive time of the year and you're going to be kind of the, the ability for us to kind of rebound positively in rebounding in terms of actually putting the body in a, an extremely anabolic environment from where it's been over the last however many weeks of dieting um, so our ability to, to benefit from nutrition is going to be absolutely massive. Um, and when we look at kind of the, the kind of the boxes that we wanted to, to tick post show, we've got to think that the, the body itself is going to be fatigued in that state. The adrenal glands are going to be fatigued from training, from stress, from, you know, increases in caffeine, all these different things that are going to play a part. So nutritional quality is going to be playing a massive part because you've got to think in an energy deficit when calories get lower our ability to kind of tick the boxes in terms of all those nutritional needs are going to be diminishing because food volume is going to be lower as well yeah. um so the first thing i do is look at establishing a diet that ticks boxes in terms of just giving the body everything it needs to be nourished and giving the body everything it needs to recover and adapt optimally and function um the next thing would be from a from a caloric perspective, how we're partitioning those calories ultimately. Now, for me, protein's probably not going to change that much year round. If somebody was like in a in a kind of heavier off season where there was a massive amount of carbohydrate, then I might boost up protein a little bit to account for kind of like the, the massive amount of incomplete proteins from carbs. Um, but like in a dieting phase, it's gonna be relatively based on their kind of set point for protein and where that range would be. Um, from a dietary fat perspective, all I'm looking like we spoke about this the other day. All I'm looking at is just putting them in a point where I know that that's going to maintain things like hormonal function and things just like just basic uh, basic bodily function through through dietary fat, a good amount of saturated fat, um, essential fatty acids, etc. And then from that set point where we know like insulin sensitivity and our ability to uptake glucose and partition those nutrients is going to be so high. 
we can benefit from carbohydrates in the diet there because a they're going to be protein sparing they're going to fuel training intensity they're going to fuel recovery um and from kind of when you say how would i partition food looking at the day from morning to to from wake to sleep the first parts that i did in food are where somebody consciously says i'm, I'm really hungry at that point because adherence is going to be risk if somebody's hungry as fuck but they're there if somebody's got loads of food post-workout but they spend the entire earlier parts of the day starving i'm going to add more food in when they're when they're actually needing food psychologically first yeah, and then that makes sense. you know from just from a basic adherence and just their their ability to kind of remain in the game um and and then from that point we've got to look at you know as training intensity increases as energy increases as our loads increase our ability to feed around the window is going to be massively beneficial. So like we said with you in terms of whether we add, you know, do I add fat, do I add carbohydrate? We know you respond very, very well to dietary carbohydrate in terms of not only the look that you can get from your body, but just in terms of the improvements in performance. Um, and I'd look to really make the most out of that peri-workout window with how many nutrients we can actually fill within that window once the rest of the day is covered and we're happy, if that makes sense. Sure. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. I think, I think people need to realise that you know there is there is a benefit of obviously situating carbs around that window, but would you agree that you know the the, the importance of that is is certainly higher when we are in this lean state, um, and, and and obviously as we add body fat. As we incrementally add body fat, the calories are going to go up anyway. So situating calories throughout the day evenly, but still having an awareness of the, the peri-workout windows is probably key. Like, you know, for example, you, we don't want someone to take away from this podcast that, you know, oh, okay, peri-workout nutrition is key. And then throughout the entire off-season, they're trying to shove yeah. in their entire carbohydrate intake peri-workout. Yeah, yeah. That's, gonna, that's just going to lead to malabsorption of nutrients at the end of the day at some point, isn't it, most yeah. likely? Sure. I, I'd, the, the, like we said before, the first thing I do is make sure that the, the whole day is, is fine in terms of just their ability to – um, kind of just function day to day and be satiated and kind of control appetite. So yeah. when we're in a surplus, our need for kind of cramming food to maximize performance is going to be less, like you said. So um, I'd be more inclined to spread food across the day then so we can just benefit from just the frequency of feedings and nutrient uptake per feeding, um, but still have an emphasis on placing, you know, a, a larger bulk of especially carbohydrate around training because we know from like a kind of um, GLUT4 translocation and insulin sensitivity and nutrient uptake perspective post-workout, we're going to benefit from that. But yeah. the need to do that is obviously less if we're in a in a surplus of energy and we've got food that we can use as, as we want to. Sure, sure. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think that covers nutrients quite well. Um, obviously, there's going to be a lot of individual variability. So if you guys are, are in that post-competition window – Perhaps comment below if you're on YouTube and just ask a specific question. But if you want to ask a specific question, do it on the YouTube rather than sort of sending us a – I mean, you can send DMs, but, you know, do it on the YouTube so that other people can benefit from it and give as yeah. much context as you can. So if, you, if, you, if you're giving us sort of like, you know, oh, um, I just finished my bikini show, what should I do? That's not enough context. We need to know sort of body weight. We need to know where your finishing finishing calories were. Uh, we need to know a little bit about how you're feeling, etc. Um, and then we can give pro probably some more ge more general, sorry, more specific advice as opposed to sort of the generalistic terms. Now, quickly to cover. Obviously, we've discussed the high stress environment that we're going to be post show in terms of mm. training volume. Training volume most likely has been decently high um whether we're using training volumes and output for calories which can be done for some people or, or whether we're simply just trying to do enough to retain as much tissue as possible uh, mm. training volume or training intensity is likely to be high and um, the stress on the joints tendons ligaments etc is likely to have been high for some time also um what would your generic approach be to the initial first week away from the stage and what would you advise to a client sort of coming straight off stage their final show is done 
Um, what would you do from a training perspective in that first week, in your opinion? Uh, just from the point of view of just someone's mental sanity and also the point of view that they've probably gone out post-show and had a little bit more food or the day after or whatever, I wouldn't remove training, but I'd place yeah, an emphasis on... Some people on, do that though, right? Why do you think people do that? Just, I think there's probably a, in your head, there's probably an immediate need to think, if I'm knackered, I'll take, I'll take a week off or something. Um, but we can still recover. With bodybuilding in general. We can still recover being active. We can still recover from just switching our emphasis in the training to, to taking less emphasis of, you know, mechanical loading and high stress work and just taking an emphasis on just getting in, just having an efficient, productive session without causing too much fatigue. You know, intensity is going to be rained back and it's almost like running a bit of a deload. Um, you know, instead of doing five sessions, we might pull back to three full body sessions or something. But I just still keep some form of stimulus there. Um, it's just the intensity in which that's performed is being um, manipulated to improve rate of recovery. Um, and in that post show window or whatever post diet window, you know, especially for you, AJ, being having dieted for such an incredibly long period of time, um, which I admire massively, but we've got to think, you know, post show, although you've managed it very well, we're still going to be in a position where we're going to need to support some systems internally to then get back function as, as quickly as possible. So when we look at things like the adrenal glands, when we look at the stress that the body's gone through from, you know, hormones, high stress hormones being circulated in the body and the amount of time you spent kind of in a sympathetic state of the of the nervous system, looking at things like adaptogenic curves, looking at things like you're nailing your sleep, but not a lot of people have the same focus of sleep quality and hygiene as you would. So for a lot of people, when sleep deteriorates during prep, that's the first thing we've got to get back into order. Um, and it's getting somebody's relationship with, you know, even the time they go into bed and how consistent they are with just managing sleep, how consistent they are with things like stimulant use post prep when it's been relatively high. All these things are going to play a massive part in our ability to get to that productive off-season state as quickly as possible. Um, there's things to think about. Yeah, for sure. Would you recommend people that are very <coughs> sort of um, ad, ad, adamant users of, of, of stimulant-based products, whether it be pre-workouts, fat burners, or, 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 or just simply tons of coffee, would you recommend a short deload or taper mm. of those 100%. products most show? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, you would, would just you sort of think, taper them or would you take them out completely I'd, I'd, I'd probably taper them because just because going cold turkey is probably going to be a bit shit um, <laughs> and we can still replace a lot of these things you know if you like the focus of caffeine if you like the kind of mental clarity of these stimulants then we can still get the same benefit from other things that aren't going to be as stimulatory like things like nootropics and stuff like that but you know my main emphasis is going to be just supporting everything internally post prep and a big part of that in terms of fat loss is going to be the the prolonged period of time we've spent with those high stress hormones cortisol circulating very high which is cortisol is great if we want to get lean because that's going to be elevated anyway from our efforts in terms of fat mobilization but post prep and in terms of accruing as much tissue as possible we need to rein this stuff back in as soon as possible and you've got to look at people in prep that are using caffeine across the day pre-workouts you know, fat burners with a lot of stimulants in like shreddable and all these crazy things, you know, the, the, the impact that's having on you internally is so big. And the, the reason why you're shit, why your sleep is shit is because the body is just in this constantly stimulated, you know, stimulated position. And I've seen you in terms of your supplements, like you have black coffee and that's basically it. But you'll, yeah, you'll see guys like popping shreddable before cardio in the morning, shreddable before, you know, pre-workout. It's just insane the amount of stress that they're putting their bodies in. And that takes time to recover from. So, you know, post-prep, it's got to be, this stuff's got to be rained back as soon as possible because that's not a, a productive position to be in. So, A, you maximize recovery, um, but B, you just get into a productive off-season as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And I think, you know, one last thing on the training perspective, I think from what I've seen anecdotally, like not so much with my clients because I tried to spot the trends when people are falling out of out love with things. Yeah. But a lot of people do fall out of love with training um, towards the end. I had phases, funnily enough, actually quite a long time ago in prep 
it was when I had to go through those really big digging phases where I wasn't quite lean yet and I couldn't really see what I wanted to see in the mirror, but yeah. I was still feeling like dog shit. Yeah. Those phases were really tough and it was really hard when my lifts, like my favourite lifts, like the squat and the deadlift started coming down and dwindled away. Performance was 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 definitely taking an effect and, and, and that's the detrimental side of, of a harsh calorie deficit for, for some people um, or for most especially with the compound moves. So mm. I found that definitely towards the end, really maximizing my time spent on movements that I knew I could provide intensity with, for example, a supported squat, like a hack or a V squat yeah. or a machine supported shoulder move. Uh, same with a chest move, potentially, you know, looking more towards the moves that I could actually attack as opposed to the moves that were dwindling away. Now, you don't mm. want to change stuff like crazily. You want to be as like for like as you can, but doing so can actually promote a really good response in my opinion. Um, mm. Therefore, for me, my training performance towards the end not only fueled by the calories coming up, but my training performance has gotten better by fact of me doing stuff that, that really puts me in an advan advantageous place. 100%. Um, so, I think I see far too often people trying to hold on to those to those movements that are simply just not 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 even worth it towards the end, and you'd actually yeah. get more bang for your buck out of doing a move that that makes more sense. Um, yeah. And if anything, probably they they're just it's just a heightened risk of injury. Uh, by yeah. the time you know you're getting 180 kilos on your back for a squat. And you've got striated glutes, you know, and and all you feel is your low back. Like that's how my squat felt towards the end. Is like the ca the cadence of the reps were were abysmal. I felt it all all in my lower back, and the intraset rest pause was abysmal to try mm. and eke out the same number as I got last week. But that's because I'm just a stubborn little bastard. And that's how <laughs> that's, that's how you should be, but yeah. to an extent, right? Yeah, that, that's just, you know, that's the typical kind of, we've got an emotional attachment to certain movements that feel good at some points when we're, you know, pushing variables, we've got a lot of food, we're strong, but, yeah. you know, especially you see a lot of the, the smarter bodybuilders doing this now, and you're doing this now, and a lot of guys that will be in our circle are doing it in terms of, you know, stimulus to the, in the gym is going to be relative to you know, your mechanics and your ability to execute the, these different movements. But we've got to think even year round, not even in prep and off season, just regardless of any, anything to do with that. If we can get more stimulus and recruitment from something like a pendulum squat or a machine, as opposed to a barbell squat, that barbell squat offer, offer, offers us zero additional benefit mm -hmm. apart, you know, as long as it's, it's free weight, it's, it's whatever. It does not matter. The same stimulus is going through that tissue. And if we can gain more stability on something supported in a more stable environment, that's going to be more beneficial to us, whether we're in a surplus or a deficit. Yeah. Um, and I imagine you've seen, I know you've changed gyms as well, and yeah. your exercise selection has improved massively at this new gym. I imagine you've seen massive turnover and just, just positive turnover to just the, the the ability for you to create quality quality contractions and the productivity of your sessions just from being able to lock into better, more efficient movements, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the environment was key as well. The environment yeah. was totally different and that, that provided a huge new stimulus for me that was that was only positive. Um, wicked, yeah. cool. Well, I think we've covered that well. Um, we will quickly now roll through quick fire um, or as quick fire as we can be on the questions that, that I got this morning when I asked for them on Instagram. So first up, we uh, did we really answer this? I'm not really sure. Um, we kind of did, kind of didn't, so we'll cover it. So it's, it's from one of my clients, Safe. So it's essentially nutrient timing when in off season. Does it matter? And if so, how much? Okay. The nutrient timing in regards to what nutrient or just in general? Just in general. Good question, but yeah, I, I, he hasn't specified, so I imagine in general, how much does does nutrient timing play a role when you are in sort of that peak off-season phase? Mm. Like, like we said before, less so. The only things I'd say from a nutrient timing perspective in off-season are 
we're still stimulating MPS consistently across the day in the doses we need to stimulate it. Um, so that's staying up regulated for longer periods of time and is consistent. Um, and also the fact that, you know, even when carbohydrate still gets high, we should always still consider the fact that there are certain periods around around that day, around that training window where we can benefit from them more. But it doesn't mean that we need to place 90% of our carbs post-workout. It just means that potentially we just partition a tiny bit more in that window and then we spread the rest across the day just to benefit from just frequency of meals and your ability to actually just eat the food as well. You know, if I, if I spread all my carbohydrate intake post-workout, I'd probably die. Um, so, you know, you know, I'll, I'll, yeah, it's just too much GI stress, right? So, um, just spreading out across the day, but pay, placing an emphasis on, you know, being smart with how we're timing it. But when somebody's in a surplus of, uh, of calories, then the whole nutrient timing perspective is less of a priority, but it still can be benefited upon. Cool. Awesome. Now, Ross asks, during off season, how much weight would you recommend to add per week? So I'm gonna we, we're we're gonna answer this with relevance to Ross because I know roughly what Ross weighs um, okay. from from prepping him in the past. So I believe that now he'll be sort of anywhere between 170 to 180 pounds. Um, so his stage weight would have been around about well one the mid 150s 160s. So how much weight, if you were coming from the 150s, 160s last time, you know, for a 150 to 160 pound bodybuilder on stage, how much mm. weight should be should we be looking to add into the body weight uh, per week in an off season? It's, it's an interesting one because a lot of people kind of asphyxiate over what's my rate of gain supposed to be. And the same with the fat loss phase, what is my rate of loss supposed to be? Yeah. And again, I hate saying it, but it's it's the it's the whole thing of it depends, and it's relative to that person. You know, a lot you'll see a lot of things saying, you know, it's one percent body accumulation per week, or it's however many pounds, or whatever. Like typically for guys that will be with me that are in off season phase, especially when they've come from that leaner set point and body weight's low, it might be like a pound or or so a week. But I'm not too fussed if there's no definitive time frame to say right we need to get here asap i'm not too fast in thinking i need to consistently hit a rate of gain every week it's just i'm monitoring composition and i'm monitoring their response and if i feel like they've stalled for five days or seven days i'll trickle a little bit more food in and then i'll reassess on a weekly basis so you know we could go like a week and a half with the body not budging at all and then that gives me an indication of right we can probably push the bracket, bracket here a little bit and push a little bit more food um yeah. I don't I don't really view it as a weekly thing, but I guess, you know, if you wanted to use that kind of 1% of total body weight, it could work. But how would you view that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'd agree. I'd go very much visually and by how someone's feeling. I mean, you can yeah. start to tell, you can start to tell whether someone's getting to the point where we've sort of capped off a pushing up phase when yeah, yeah. They're, they're really starting to not feel good. They get an overall look that just... It just looks like month to month or week Softer. to week. They're, yeah, they're just soft. They're not looking any better. Potentially, we're having some issues with actually getting contractions in a pump in the gym. I've noticed mm, yeah, that yeah. a few people where they're just so That's, flooded with nutrients that... It's also going to be take home to when we bang on about this kind of blood sugar thing, you know, the whole lack of pump. And I, I think it might have been on your page or somebody else's page. Somebody talking about, you know, the higher body fat goes, the harder it is for our, for us to kind of uptake glucose. And if we're not getting a pump in the gym and food's high, then there's something wrong. Yes. Um, and like blood sugar is going to be a marker. And, you know, if we're spending prolonged periods of time with that above the quote unquote optimal range, which is going to be relative to someone and their carbohydrate intake and their lifestyle. But if we're getting above that range, then for prolonged periods of time, we're just getting closer and closer and closer to just a, a metabolically inefficient place where our ability to partition nutrients and uptake food is going to be poor. And that's when, you know, it's law of diminishing returns. I've been there, most people have been there where, you know, the rate of fat gain is going to be more and quicker than the rate of lean tissue. And it's just not conducive to progress at all. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. We kind of touched on that already um, into the next question, which is from Steve at Revive Stronger, who asks about how you use blood glucose readings from clients to help program their nutrition 
Um, mm. Especially with sort of your your natural drug free clients as well. He sort of said that or alluded to that. Okay, so we know that it's probably worth saying that you know we did the podcast on it before. Um, the optimal range that we've given, you've got to think that, like, in research, when people are studying this stuff, whether it's animals, whether it's humans, whatever, like, the optimal ranges probably aren't being tested on athletes or on people that hold an extremely high level of lean tissue relative to, like, the normal generic population. So when somebody comes and says, you know, I can't get my fasted blood sugar below 5 or I can't get it below 4.8, it's never 4.2 or whatever, you know, it's relative to you. And if you're on 800, 700, 800 grams of carbs a day, it might be at the higher range, which is still fine. Um, but for me, if we're measuring that on a weekly basis and we're getting, whether it's every day or whether it's three or four times a week, if I'm seeing a consistent trend in that accumulating, getting getting higher, and I'm not putting protocols in place to actually lower that in the first place, whether that's supplementation or recovery or sleep or whatever, you know, we've got to make some form of dietary intervention to then bring that down. And that's either going to be just general calories coming down for them to get leaner, or it's going to be putting things in place to partition, partition nutrients differently, more towards potential dietary fat as opposed to carbohydrate if it's not getting partitioned properly. Um, like week to week, it's just looking at collating data and getting just, just looking at trends like you would with, every, with everything else. Okay. Wicked. Um, right, one more question and then we'll leave it for today. So, a bit of an interesting question here. Um, so, oh, I can't see his name, but it's, he's Mr. Marwaha on Instagram. Right. Cool name. So, when to use GDAs on non training days? If carbs are sub 50 grams in order to further lower fl fasted blood glucose levels? Um, Bit of an odd question, really, isn't it? Cause I so, really unless somebody's highly insulin resistant and their fasted blood sugar is high by default, mm -hmm. you know, blood sugar is going to be low throughout that day if we're on 50 grams. So, I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't use them at all. Um, and if, if would, they, would they benefit at all? Would they, would, 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 they, would they potentially lower blood glucose levels, or would they not have any effect? If 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 it, if if fasted morning blood sugar was high, and we were to take something like a GDA upon wake, then it would lower it. Okay. Um, but I'd I'd more like for example, sometimes I've used like protocols where I, you know, like something like your himbin, which is going to be um, effective if the presence of insulin is really really low in the blood. Like I've used protocols where I'll actually get them to take a GDA upon wake before they take your himbin to then completely clear out um, blood sugar levels in the blood so that your himbin becomes more effective. But from his question, like if we're looking at the root of root cause, if fasted blood sugar levels are, are high on that rest day where there's zero carb, then the actual root cause is going to be training days being too high. And I I sort the root cause before I would enter kind of adding them on an on-training day. Okay, cool. If that makes Wicked. sense. Wicked. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Cool. Um, have you got anything else to leave at all, or do you think that we've covered everything pretty cool today? That's okay. Yeah, that's cool. Wicked. Cool, cool, cool. Um, right, guys, we'll wrap things up. So um, thanks very much for hanging around and listening, if you have. Um, make sure to continue to follow both me and Callum on Instagram and we Facebook. need to find a, we need to find a name for this series. Of course we do. Yeah, we need to find a name. So guys, to submit a name, uh, ideally either shoot us at Instagram, DM is fine for that, or um, comment below on the YouTube and we'll, we'll pick we'll pick one. And by the next episode, we'll have a we'll have a name. Um, so yeah, cheers guys for for listening. Cheers Callum for your for your time again, mate. And uh, I'm sure we'll speak soon.